Welcome Knights of Hollow Nest to a video long overdue. I recently polished off my third playthrough of Hollow Knight, Pantheon of Hollow Nest grind notwithstanding. While that hustle is yet to bear victorious fruit, it did inspire me to finally deliver my ranking of Hollow Knight's boss quality, a roster of battles I consider to be one of the greatest ever made. Though plowing your way repeatedly through endgame boss rushes makes all but a few difficulty juggernauts mere speed bumps, the care put into each and every design shines through brilliantly. A few disclaimers before we begin. I ran through the Hall of the Gods practice area to get my own boss footage for this video, but I will be judging each boss both on their merit in the standard playthrough without full upgrades and their endgame value. Additionally, I'll be combining all bosses with dream and non-dream variants. I'll provide passing remarks on the weaker models, but once you've danced within the dreams, it's hard to see the originals as anything other than reality in slow motion. With that out of the way, let's jump into my ranking of the Hollow Knight bosses from worst to best. Number 25, Flukemar. There are two kinds of knights, one with this as their waifu, and those that fall victim to the allure of the gaping holes of Fluke Mama. Mossbags proclaim MILF of Hallowness clearly drained Team Cherry's creative stamina after putting a bow on her spectacular visual design. Because all we're left with in the gameplay department is a difficulty deficient slog with this nail gobbling matriarch. There's multiple platforms suggesting you take a multifaceted approach, but forget that nonsense. Just bounce on her head and give her the abyss shriek until dead. Assuming you don't have end game damage output and are forced to deal with this for longer, you'll need to smack the two slobbering teeth mosquitoes she'll periodically squirt out. And that's it. No other attacks, just letting you farm endless soul to ram deep into her every hole. Gross. Number 24, Traitor Lord. From a boss too passive to one overly active. Traitor Lord is the real question to what if we gave the player a taste of what it's like to be railed with the quick nail? The answer is a speedy obese mantis that will slice your health down to zilch in record speed. This is thanks to the rare yet punishing mechanic of bosses in Hollow Knight doing two masks of damage instead of one. In battles where there's consistent metered pressure from the boss, this is fine. But to me, Traitor Lord crosses that line. You either execute flawless evasion of his frequent assaults or get wrecked. The fairness in this design comes from his limited attacks and clear methods of dealing with them. You can shade dash or jump over his charge, you can basically stand still to avoid his leap, and his smash to spawn vertical energy waves is well telegraphed. Careful if you run to heal, however, because you're liable to get orange frisbees chucked your way. Though a certain NPC can provide a diversion, it's still rough if you're inexperienced and undergeared. In the endgame with the best charms and max upgrades, this fight is balanced. But if you happen upon him without those in the main game, this fight leans more toward punishing than rewarding. Enough to shove him toward the bottom of a very competitive list. Number 23, The Boring Bunch. This collection of snooze fest will compile every boss I think deserves equal dishonors for being overly simple. Grusmother is a bouncing lump of bug fat that has a charge and methodical hyper smash that's easy to avoid. Soul Warrior will teleport around body slamming you, shooting magic at you, and lunge for a swipe. Vengefly King rees loudly while summoning lesser nuisances and floating above and elongating a mindless battle. Massive Moss Charger is like the game Bop It cranked up to 11 with Bop It as the only option. In both the Crystal and Enraged Guardian shoot lasers at various speeds while hopping around and summoning vertical lasers in a weak effort to be less one-dimensional. These fights aren't bad per se. I would actually consider them to be quite solid, but their elementary design more appropriate for miniboss standing can't stack up against the incredible competition to come. Number 22, Winged Nosk. Whether we're talking the flying or land variant, Nosk boils down to a simple formula. Dodge acid and pogo as he scrambles by. The land model has a safe spot on the left side of the arena that makes healing a breeze, and there's a decent amount of time between the winged version sweeps. Nosk lasts long enough and has enough mechanics between the various ways it shoots acid and the constant pressure it puts on to barely miss out on being a member of the boring bunch, but being slightly better than a group of mini boss tier battles isn't anything to be proud of. Number 21, Brooding Malak. Pump Nosk full of lard and acid and you've got this buggy barfing behemoth. It will fire off a few acid shots while swiping with a sword-like arm. After a handful of acid is spread, it either leaps at you then hops back, or fires a massive blast of acid that covers the entire side it fired to war. To dodge, you'll need to dash to its other side, where you'll be rewarded with a massive damage window. There's not much more to it on the surface, but where the fight becomes interesting is in the early game when you can't just tank through it. When you need to heal in a pinch, you realize how much pressure it lays on. Granted, some of the boring bunch make healing tough as well, but not to the degree that Malak can through the acid it shoots. That slight elevation in pressure is more than any boss so far other than the traitorous beefcake, earning it higher marks than its simplistic peers. 
Number 20, Oblobble. Take away all of Malik's attacks aside from spewing acid, make it airborne, and double the trouble. That's the Oblobble duo in a nutshell. Trying to dodge the acid rain is absolute chaos. However, since you'll likely face them in the Colosseum or Pantheon in the endgame, you're liable to have the health needed to tank through their barrages and melt them. The extra wrinkle that I like is the second Blobble getting an HP and speed boost when the other bites the dust. It poses a strategic question of which phase you want to last longer offering the trickier option to melt both as much as possible before the first kicks the bucket. It's a nice touch that gets you thinking a bit more, enough to keep Oblobble out of the bottom five. Number 19, Warrior Dreams. These deceased warriors that invite you into their dreams to tango are just as mechanically simple as the boring bunch, with a common theme of flying around and throwing crap at you. Elder Who waddles through the air while slamming yellow pancakes on you in randomized patterns. Gorb ascends in spirit only as he spams sword AoEs in pairs of one, two, and threes. Galian makes himself a punching bag while failing to hypnotize you with his back and forth weapon slam. Zero fire swords like their boomerangs while floating back and forth. No eyes lets the stage be the sword while forcing you to give chase amongst a bunch of ghosts, Marmu uses its body as a weapon to relentlessly slam into you, and Markov gives players conniptions with his shielded sword summon combo, especially in the Pantheon of Hallowness where the floor is an empty pit supported only by walls and five bite-sized platforms. I would argue that in terms of combat, these warrior dreams are just as simple as a boring bunch and can be more frustrating, especially when the floor gets pulled out from beneath you in the later iterations. That said, they get the edge for having some nice lore and personality in the main game. There's something ethereal about taking on fallen warriors that haven't let go of their defeat yet and promptly serving them up a dose of nail-skewered reality. While their quality may not be far beyond the bottom of the barrel in combat, I thoroughly enjoyed their story beats enough to give them a boost in the ranking. Number 18, Umu. If you weren't sure about Hollow Knight's status as a Metroidvania, this homage smashing you over the head with subtlety should leave no doubt. The fight will vary greatly depending on which version you face. The main campaign is more of a cinematic battle with Quirrell joining the fray to make it vulnerable at regular intervals. In between these openings, you have to hop around to avoid its girth, avoid lightning that tracks you for a few seconds, and a summoning of shock that consistently spawns at the same spots around the arena. In the Pantheon, you're on your own, so to make Umu vulnerable, you'll have to wait for it to summon jellyfish exploders to break its shell. You can smack them with the sword to make the shot fly straight into her, or take the easier option and fire Shade Soul to make them ride into her with ease. I used to struggle greatly with her in the Pantheon until I discovered this, so hopefully that is helpful to someone out there. In terms of lore, I have a lot of appreciation for taking on this experiment on the path to freeing Monomon. In terms of combat prowess, I appreciate the diversion from standard nail smacking battles. The pressure Imu puts on is very fair, well telegraphed, and adds intensity as you try to put it in position to open its defenses. Once you get the hang of it, it becomes a breeze that is plenty enjoyable, hitting just above the average line with 17 more fights to go. Number 17, The Collector. This is by no means a deep battle. The Collector hops around with a frantic energy before shooting into the ceiling. Before dropping back in, you'll be greeted by containers full of various weak bugs to create diversions. With the long, dusty tail of them falling and dashing making it easy to quickly slice them down to size, it makes keeping the pressure on the Collector an easy feat. What makes a fight worthy of climbing above other simple affairs is character. You ascend to the peak of the Tower of Love only to find a shady creep that has kidnapped bugs to catch his eye. His response to your arrival is to throw them at you in droves while maniacally giggling from start to finish. There's something hilarious about his demeanor that gets me every time. Even if his only attack is hopping around in the rare slap upside the head, the energy he brings to the table is leagues beyond our combatants so far. You like jazz? Number 16, Hive Knight. I'm gonna be straight with you all, Hive Knight is a fight that I've never truly gotten good at. His frequent stuns and moderate downtime between attacks encourages a mindless quick nail slashing strategy that I can't help but execute. He'll teleport and backslash, do a lunging stab, spawn spike shooting balls, and fire out a horde of descending bees. But it just doesn't matter. Unless you're facing him very early on in the game, outpacing his damage and healing during his staggers is far too easy to pull off. While I can see the merit in his variety of attacks, the lack of pressure lets you run wild with little penalty. The only actual deterrent is his run back. It's long and full of bloated bees that do a ton of damage that'll make you go insane long before the knight's battle does. Even when you do adequately commit to dodging his strikes, it's basically dash through the slice and jump over the lunge. Done deal. I do like the knight, but your ability to strike through his mechanics keeps him from cracking the top 15. 
Number 15, Failed Champion. The game's first boss and his dream evolution are excellent examples of a simple boss with layers. His basic attacks include hopping up and down to slam on you and backing up for a huge swing with a shockwave. The difficulty of dodging these attacks is increased dramatically through his gargantuan thickness. Once you crack through it though, you get the comedic revelation that there's a gooey weakling center. Damaging this center is your path to victory. But you have a couple of unspoken strategic options along with it. You'll notice that you only gain soul, your method of healing and using powerful magic, by hitting the true boss. With the failed champion, however, you can dream nail the shell for extra soul. And thanks to a Twitch viewer that pointed this out to me recently, you can pogo off his armor to reset his stagger timer. And his third stagger is infinite without any pogos necessary. This means infinite soul gathering and heals, something that is infinitely useful, especially in the pantheons. Another neat bit are the rocks he summons down with his slams. These offer passable, if a bit risky, times to heal, but also an opportunity to smack rocks at his shelf for great damage. Failed Champion and his weaker counterpart are great examples of how to take something simple, but add cool tricks and nuances that make it an elevated experience both as a starter boss and an endgame challenge. Number 14, Lost Kin. This is a more intense version of the Hive Knight experience. Much like Hive Knight, Lost Kin will be regularly stunned, but instead of creating easy opportunities for heals, you have to wager how long he'll be down and how well you can manage the orange floaters he summons to home in on you. Going heavy spam without getting a good healing window can quickly lead to death, especially if you get greedy and try to heal when the kin is active. It'll work sometimes, but more often than not, he'll drop right on your head. That's easily the hardest part of the fight, reading where he's gonna jump. His other attacks are much better to take advantage of, but I have to admit that despite their decent tells, I struggle to react in time due to my attack spam. If I stop spamming, I find the fight goes on long enough that I end up in trouble anyway, so let loose with the nail, I say. The one strange thing about Kin is that he loses the huge screen infection spam his lesser counterpart has. I imagine it was to balance out how aggressive the dream version is, which is a nice touch. The lore of facing off against one of your brethren is pretty neat. This fight is the first on the list I find to offer a moderate and fair challenge for a fun skill check, and we're just getting started. Number 13, God Tamer. An underrated praise I can offer to the game's bosses is that it knows how to design gank fights right. This is on brilliant display in your match against God Tamer and his beast. The Tamer will hop around in an extremely long tell to slam you with his beating stick. Meanwhile, the bulky bug in the back fires off three splatters of acid, then charges in at you. There's nice audio cues for each of these attacks, and both have great uses. The acid can provide a solid healing window, while the big roll lets you control where you fight. The beast will always track you off the lead from the charge, so you can bait it wherever you like. Of course, spam is viable here with the right charms and wrong level of restraint, but it's still plenty of fun taking the slower route. An interesting bit that I didn't notice until my recent playthrough is that the tamer submits when you slay the beast, so that's your only true objective. Their movesets are simple like some of the lower entries, but that works well in a tandem fight so you can keep fair control over the chaos. It's impressive design that starts a coming wave of excellent gank battles. Number 12, Brothers Oro and Mato. Continuing the multi-boss trend are the Nail Master duo at the peak of the first pantheon. Starting with the single brother, you'll get the chance to take in his moveset. He'll leap and slam down in a slow manner that makes it easy to dash under and smack dab booty. He'll slash forward twice, which can be dashed through, but his bulky build makes it a tight fit. Finally, he'll back off and do the dash slash nail art, which is easy enough to jump over. The intro lasts an appropriately short time, kicking you into the real fight. Expect to see the same offense as before, but now it'll come out a lot faster thanks to their teamwork. Instead of ganging up on you, they hop in and out using the previously mentioned attacks. You'll need to dodge well and punish, or go ham with spells and quick slash to KO before they can do the same to you. As long as you stay in front of them, they'll keep coming at you one by one. You can make use of the wall and dashes to punish fairly easily, but getting sandwiched in will eventually happen. That'll force you to hop in between, at which point they both unleash attacks in your direction. Moral of the story, don't stay in the middle unless you want to go full YOLO with abyss streaks to end it quickly. Healing windows in this fight can be hard to come by, so you'll have to commit to full aggro if that's your style. I love that multiple styles are viable at various levels of risk and execution. I appreciate the design of them increasing attack speed through tagging in and out and putting pressure on you if you enter the Thunderdome in the middle. And I love seeing them mix in the nail arts they taught you. It's a great appetizer to the many fantastic Pantheon battles to come. 
Number 11, Watcher Knights. Before we go full end game, let's make a brief pit stop at the Watcher Knights. This horde of knights walks an incredibly fine line between being overwhelming and hitting the spot just right. At the start, you'll be faced with a single knight. Like the Nail Master Duo, this gives you an opportunity to see its moves. A double nail slash that can be dashed through or leaped over, and various types of rolling charges that go straight on or bounce at mixed angles. When facing a single knight, this is easy peasy. When you have to deal with another five after the initial bout, consistently spawning in to make the battle remain a two on one until the end, it becomes a lot more challenging. This is particularly due to the length of the arena, forcing you to lie on audio cues to time your evasion for far away charges. Your own offense can be difficult to come by without aggressive tendencies due to their propensity to charge. Getting in close to attack will likely stop them from doing so, but you have to be prepared for a quick double slash. It's a lot to handle over the course of the fight, especially when you consider how difficult it can be to heal. I'd highly recommend you forgo healing in favor of magic, especially when it can pierce their armor when charging and get easy double hits. The expectations are certainly high, but they feel just manageable enough to never get frustrated. Once you fight them enough, you become accustomed to their capabilities to the point where you can bait bounces to Dream Nail for soul or dash through their attacks to keep heavy pressure on. And in the story fight, you can even drop a chandelier to kill a knight before the battle even begins. Nice design touches like these make what could be a frustrating battle excellent in my eyes, which should speak to how great the top 10 is shaping up to be. The age old interview question. How would you describe yourself in three words? Terrifying, beautiful, powerful, gorgeous, passionate, diligent, overwhelming, vigorous, enchanting, mysterious, sensual, fearless, invincible Grey Prince Zoe. In a brilliant twist on the pathetic delusional Zota reality, a lustful busybody's dream shapes Zot into the adjective loaded warrior he always knew he could be. If there's any move set in the game that I have trouble nailing down, it's this meme lord. He slams with his nail shooting shockwaves in both directions, he'll belly flop through the floor falling from the sky, he fires various Zotlings that either home in on you as minor nuisances or explode for spooky levels of damage, and he likes to flail his nail around wildly in a sprint that will smash through your HP quickly if you aren't careful. Fortunately, he gets stunned at regular intervals, which offers great opportunities for healing, and many of his attacks like summoning the Zotlings leave him vulnerable to a generous amount of attack spam. I think of this fight somewhat like the Hive Knight, you are certainly rewarded for spamming, but unlike the Knight, Zot has a bigger Rolodex of mechanics to keep you guessing and layer on a lot more pressure as a result. That and if you keep battling with a dream to diminish Breda's opinion of Zot, you'll have to deal with versions getting stronger and stronger to an insane degree. I absolutely adore this twist on Zot and Breda's story. Story, the battle oozes his bumbling inability to fight all while being intimidating thanks to his dream damage, and it's plenty satisfying to dash his dreams, well worth a spot in the top 10. Number 9, Great Nail Sage Slot. In a polar opposite to the frenzied lack of control Zote has, the Great Nail Sage is just as potent of a threat while being completely controlled in his movements. This can work to your benefit or against you depending on how well you play the fight. Like a lot of the knight type battles, he'll get staggered periodically, but the offense he puts out between can melt you down enough you'll have trouble coming out on the plus end of the offensive exchanges in between. His attacks are very aggressive on the front end, making it near impossible to walk up and assault him in a standard way. For a long time, I used to all out attack him in a race to see who'd lose the fight first, but I eventually realized that baiting him is far more effective. He has a three piece attack that hits front, back, and then flies up and lands. There's a recovery period after landing, so if you use the wall to bait and leap behind it, you can get a free hit or two in, then repeat. Greed can be tempting, especially when he starts dishing out double damage with nail arts, but stay your hand except for clear openings and you can easily make it to the final phase. This also used to throw me for a loop, but it's much simpler after after some practice. Just wait for his leaps to close in on you, then dash in the opposite direction. Hop back in real quick for a smack, rinse and repeat. If you can, using magic will dwindle his HP much faster, and more than any other part, you can tank and get multiple hits in to end this phase quickly. That'll all depend on how well you performed in the rest of this excellent fight, one that is well worth going through the third pantheon to experience. Number 8, Hornet Sentinel. Sly may be the great nail sage and Flukmar may be the MILF, but the Hornet is the master of the thread and needle and the true waifu of Halonest. While her early fight is quite slow once you've gone deep into the game, it's excellent for the start of the game and introduces a fantastic character. Your second encounter is where the ante is up quite a bit. It feels as if her speed nearly doubles, and she adds in a parry and threaded spike balls throughout the arena. It's very much a read and react sort of fight, though you can get a lot out of shooting magic from afar. She will regularly stun 
stun, which is a great time to heal. Otherwise, you won't get much of an opportunity without a hint of luck. She doesn't have the highest HP, so it's not too difficult to blast through. There are patterns to take advantage of her, like the guaranteed jump after being hit out of a stagger, and trapping her in a corner is worth tanking the damage to unleash a heavy barrage on her. In the main game, there's a ton of mystery to the first fight, with a load of gravitas in the second. The arena is beautiful, and the upped intensity feels well matched to test your progress. Watching her in action these days just makes me dream of Silk Song's release. Until then, I'll get my Hornet fill by duking it out across either phenomenal battle. Welcome back. I'm certainly glad you decided to spend a half hour with us today. I think you'll enjoy the little painting we're gonna do, and I hope you take the time to paint along. Number seven, Paintmaster Shio. I'm quite curious to see how ranking Shio well above his nailed brethren is received. Personally, I think the quad flavored paint battle is marvelous. Yellow indicates a stage wide thrust, blue shoots out three arced blobs of paint, Red has Shio jump and fire an arc of red paint, then slam down, and Magenta brings out the Great Slash with a light rain to follow. Keeping an eye on Shio's shoulder and quickly reacting to each with the appropriate response is exactly what I love about bosses in this game. The level of aggression is balanced perfectly to give you time to strike, but not so much you can spam without being punished. The one knock I have on Shio in that regard is his HP. It's not nearly high enough for a one-on-one -on -one endgame fight. I would have loved to see it last longer because it does become a battle you can spam straight through, which is a shame because dodging each attack well and getting an earned punish is very rewarding. Even so, I always have a blast every time I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shio. Number 6, Soul Tyrant. This battle was the bane of my existence in my first playthrough. Not only could I not get down his timings, not only did I blow at keeping up with his teleports, but the run back after losing to Soul Master was downright brutal. The time invested made me a lot better at the fight, however, so now the turn's table. Though, even after all my practice, Soul Tyrant still has my number. The teleports are far faster, his dive attack somehow manages to catch me off guard more often than not, especially with the fake out, the camera stretching to not show him sometimes confuses me as to whether he's gonna fire an orb, sweep across the floor, or hover over the center with his parallel line orbs. Those can be hard to attack through, but if you can get the timing down it's quite nice, not to mention it's a perfect time to heal as you're completely safe to stand dead center in the arena. The final phase with him going crazy used to get to me, but once I started hopping up as I dashed I found a lot more success. I'm not the best at dodging the orbs once he stands still, but if you do well enough throughout the rest of the fight, it won't be too bad. Despite any difficulties I have with the boss, none of them are things I can point to and say, that's bad design. Quite the opposite. I can't believe how well they managed to balance a boss that can teleport and attack with lightning speed. You get fair opportunities to heal and attack, and though his movements draw out the battle, it never feels like it outstays its welcome. It's a fight that I appreciate more and more as time goes on, barely losing out to a killer top 5. Number 5, Absolute Radiance. This is the first in a trifecta of bosses in Hollow Knight that escalate the difficulty dramatically beyond the rest of the roster. Absolute Radiance goes even further beyond to stand as one of the hardest bosses I've fought in a long time. In comparison to the majority of the bosses in the game that have platforming play second fiddle to straight up brawls, Absolute Radiance puts platforming front and center through operating as a giant environmental hazard with a health bar. The standard version is a slow, pared down fight compared to the absolute chaos of the Pantheon variant. Not only is the speed dramatically increased in a fight that already has a ton going on, you now take double massive damage and there are 6 total phases. Let's take it step by step. Phase 1 begins on a flat platform with the Radiance teleporting between different attacks. It can call waves of spikes vertically or horizontally in groups of 3s and 4s. It can summon 2 flurries of spikes on itself that cascade outward. It can summon 3 or 4 orbs that take a moment to spawn but then rubber band to you extremely hard. It can summon 3 burst waves of light and it can call a single large beam of light to cross the arena. Sound like a lot? It is, especially when you enter phase 2 and these moves start combining together along with spikes spawning on half of the floor. Healing windows can be had, but you need to be very strategic about timing. You never know for certain when another attack will start, and some like the horizontal spikes have such a quiet sound cue that you can put yourself in a bad position without even realizing it. After enough damage, there's a brief phase 3 that is hitting between vertical spike rain, then the longest phase begins. It's essentially phase 1, but with nearly double the health. Instead of taking place on flat ground, you now have to balance moving across many small platforms and getting to wherever the Radiance teleports to output damage. As you can imagine, this makes evasion exponentially more difficult. The pressure it puts on you to make brash moves to get off damage and make the phase end more quickly is a perfect recipe for disaster. If you make it through, you enter stage 5, the climb. 
You must ascend platforms sequentially while the Radiance fires beams of light at you from above. Near the bottom, they seem more random, but as you ascend, they track better and better. This can make healing a gamble on the lower end and nearly impossible when up high. It is insanely disappointing to have an excellent first four phases only to lose 60 to 80% of your health on this climb, because you'll need it for the final phase. While this phase does have low HP, you still have to manage your dashes, double jumping, pogoing, and dodging well to avoid the consistently spawning orbs and track the radiance as it teleports. This phase isn't all that bad as long as you got here with five masks or more, but that's easier said than done. Pogoing feels like the way to go, especially if you're thoughtful in evading the orbs as they rise to meet you. With the stage set, I have to admit that I've come to love this fight. It forces me to play defensively when I would typically be more greedy. You never want to overextend because it can spell a domino effect of disaster that leads to a quick loss. A loss that can be all the more devastating if it's at the end of the Pantheon of Hollow Nest. All the moves are balanced well, other than perhaps the nail waves having a quiet spawn sound. There are subtle elements like noticing a guaranteed teleport at the end of the nail waves to guarantee an attack window, or that the triple burst waves of light never spawn in the same place consecutively. I do have a few issues, such as the lights being difficult to see against the background, the jump phase feeling like half crapshoot, half skill, a darkness glitch that decided randomly that I'm gonna lose whether I like it or not, and a wide array of attacks that means sometimes combos are worse than others, making RNG play a decent role. That said, I found it very rewarding to practice and get better like all the fights in the top five. And though I think Absolute Radiance is the most unbalanced of the bunch, it's still a fight I've come to enjoy immensely. Number 4, White Defender. Going from serious difficulty to silly Doma Doma action. White Defender and his counterpart both embody the fun and silliness the Collector had to offer, but match it with a fantastic one-on-one -on -one battle. He'll dive in and stay underground, stay underneath and pop out flinging his crap balls everywhere. He'll toss out some of those balls around the arena, even opting to join in himself to create a ping pong nightmare. He'll even slam on the ground to create big shockwaves. He eventually ups the ante with a loud chest drum leading to a bunch of whack-a-mole moments. Each attack has fair ways to take advantage, there are generous windows to heal that can be punished from time to time to keep you guessing, and the pure joy I get from listening to this gleeful dung beetle engage in combat with the knight is magical. I adore this boss with every fiber of my being. Making the list at number 4 isn't to say it's not spectacular, but the top 3 are near perfect, enough to keep white defender doma domoing throughout the waterways of number 4. Number 3, Pure Vessel. A pure treat to end the fourth pantheon, Godholm makes it possible to face the Hollow Knight in his prime before he was corrupted by the infection. In the original fight, there are a decent amount of acid-based attacks, and you see the mind of the Hollow Knight slowly degrade as you battle it. The moveset is similar, but Pure Vessel takes the expectations to the next level. There are two primary methods I've seen to combat the Vessel. Either make timely use of your Shade Dash to dodge and counter, or jump and pogo over the majority of the Vessel's moves. Personally, I find the dash works better for me. If it's the piercing dash from him, blink through and clap back. If it's a triple flurry, hesitate for a moment due to the slow startup, then do the same. The spray of spikes requires patience to wait until they're about to reach you, then dash forward for a nice punish. Just be wary of him pulling the sword to parry. The diving slam that summons the vertical greatswords can be tricky, but you get into a rhythm of dodging into the right spot every time. His later explosions and mini explosions offer healing opportunities or attack windows for the bold, Finally, the tentacle attack in the final portion is a clever shakeup to those like me who like to dash, but if you just remember how many times you've knocked him down, in my case three, you'll know when to switch to jumping for evasion. You can even get a cheeky desolate dive with proper timing. Thing is, everything I just said needs to be strung together in real time, which is extremely difficult. These aren't happening one by one with a ton of downtime in between. Sometimes you get no more than a single second before you're being attacked again. Instinctive response through practice feels almost mandatory to come out on top here, but everything Pure Vessel does is balanced to absolute perfection. I love the different viable strategies work, his visual design is incredible, and I love the lore notes with the silent scream indicating no voice to cry suffering like in the Pale King's Omen. This all combined into the pinnacle of the God Home DLC for me, or so I thought. Number 2, Sisters of Battle. Previously, the Mantis Lords were one of my favorite bosses in the game. Then came the Sisters of Battle. One Mantis is easy, two Mantises is manageable but challenging, three Mantises ask you to put on your try-hard pants and execute each moment to perfection. While you are certainly asked to make critical decisions in the blink of an eye multiple times in quick succession for over a minute, it never feels like the game is setting you up for failure. Rather, it feels like the game goes out of its way to reward you for clever moments and metering your attacks. 
Mixing in a bit streak as they throw frisbees and dashing out feels godlike. Double smacking one only to dodge another for more of the same, then turning and shifting left to smack who's behind you, so on and so forth, is satisfying in a way that can only be conveyed by mastering this battle for yourself. I suppose if I were to really nitpick, I could knock the inability for you to heal unless you have incredible luck, but I personally love how the game challenges you to KO at least one mantis if you want a solid chance at getting life back. From the moment those hands snap to the defeat of the final mantis, this Pantheon battle is an absolute goldmine of entertainment. But there's one final battle that takes the cake. And the number one best boss in Hollow Knight, Nightmare King Grimm. Could it have been anyone else? Grimm's nightmarish form takes everything I love about the top five and blends it into a flawless battle. Like the absolute radiance, the expectations throughout the many different phases of battle are daunting. Though Grimm never actually changes tactics, dealing with his barrage of fireballs can be quite scary when you consider a slip up washing two masks away. Like White Defender, Grimm's charisma, sound effects, and fire soundtrack add immense entertainment to your clash. Like the pure vessel, Grimm is composed of a handful of different attacks that, while not particularly complicated in isolation, come one after the other in quick succession to the point you need to react instinctively if you want to survive. And like the Sisters of Battle, this is all polished to an unbelievable level. Grimm's moveset painting an open canvas from players to paint their strategy upon is immensely rewarding as you practice your own style. It may take quite some time, but overcoming the Nightmare King is an experience worth every second. Each and every battle I have with them to date is still demanding despite my increase in skill over the years, but one thing that hasn't changed is Grimm's tremendous quality. He's not only the best boss in Hollow Knight, he's one of the best bosses of all time. But of course, that's just my opinion. What bosses in Hollow Knight do you consider to be the worst and best? Let us know in the comments below. And of course, I want to thank you all for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.